So today we're going to talk about uh, impact loading. So this is a, an interesting topic. One of the different things about this topic relative to some of the other ones that we've done in this class is that this one involves dynamics, as the name would imply. So we are not always dealing with, uh, with things that are not moving. We have to also be able to deal with things sometimes that are moving, and that's part of what we do in here. So we're dealing with a situation uh, or, or with situations here where some uh, initial velocity, for instance, or a collision uh, have a bearing on what happens with the solution, like what kind of stresses are induced and that kind of thing. And this is why you, you may have noticed that uh, dynamics is a prereq for this class. This is one of the reasons why dynamics is a prereq for this class is that we are not dealing purely with just static type of situations. We have to also be able to deal with dynamic situations. So hopefully you enjoy this. Um, I think it's a pretty neat topic. Uh, this, this topic can actually get really, really, really complicated. And I'm going to show you a common simplification that is done for certain types of problems. This doesn't cover the world of possibilities of impact. So for instance, one of the things that can happen uh, as far as an impact problem is you can have a situation where you take uh, a, an object of some kind and you drop it on the ground. Has anyone ever dropped something and it broke? Yeah, almost probably everyone in the room has dropped something and it broke. Um, that, those types of problems are going to be difficult to deal with with the stuff that I touch on today. Um, those are much more complicated. Uh, typically, they, uh, they involve much more than single degree of freedom models of deformation. They can involve uh, sort of the resonance of the part once it hits something. It, it, basically has all this energy that's got to go somewhere. And so it, it goes into vibrating a lot of the stuff, a lot of the material that composes the part that broke. And you know what it takes to break those types of things is very difficult to deal with analytically. Uh, having said that, there are some tools available for those kinds of questions uh, in solids modeling packages and, and uh, you know simulation packages, things like SOLIDWORKS. So, um, we won't really do much of that, but I'll just, you know, if you're curious about what that kind of stuff looks like, there are actually a number of good videos out there on YouTube and other places that uh, demonstrate what it takes to do a model like that, where you drop something, you try to figure out if it's going to break, and doing that in, uh, in SOLIDWORKS. All right, so this one's a little bit different. Um, we are looking at a situation here where we are uh, looking at a soft material, you know, you can think of this as a big lump of soil, for instance. That's a good example. Think of this lump of soil that we are uh, going to allow to fall from a 10-foot height onto a beam. Okay, so that's, that's what we got uh, going on here. The beam is, the type of beam is given. It's made out of structural steel. And what we're going to try to do is find the maximum deflection that the beam uh, experiences. We will also figure out how much bending stress occurs in the beam and uh, the force experienced between the dirt and the beam uh, whenever we're at our maximum deflection. That's actually an important distinction. Um, trying to figure out how much force acts between the dirt and the beam right at the moment of impact is also a complicated problem, more complicated than I'm going to be able to deal with with these techniques. Okay? It's going to depend a lot on the specifics of the material, uh, probably particularly of the dirt, uh, possibly also of the beam. Uh, so, you know, that's not something we're going to look at, but we are going to have to deal with uh, the potential loss of energy that happens whenever that collision occurs. So we are going to deal with that. Um, up here, I basically want to sort of outline what we plan to do with this problem and so that, that we have an idea of the steps that we, got, we are going to go through. Okay. Um, first of all, over to the right, you see here a single degree of freedom model that we are going to use to try to describe how this system behaves. Okay. Some of you may have already been in a class we have called Dynamic Systems, uh, and you've probably done, uh, if, you're in, if you've been in that class already, uh, then you have seen a good number of problems where you have a spring and a mass, and that they work together. So, we can sort of model this system uh, as a plain spring with a mass on top, 
And if we do this, this is a single degree of freedom model of this particular collision that happens. And the idea is that we will be able to find some value of mass so that this single degree of freedom model here of just like a spring with a mass on top, uh, that mass parameter would be equivalent to whatever mass we have of this beam. So the thing is, whenever you deal with these impact kind of problems, uh, it matters. You, know, you have to kind of deal with the masses of the pieces that collide with one another. This beam has a mass to it. And so we have to deal with that, and we're going to come up with an, a, a way of coming up with a, a equivalent mass so that uh, what we come up with with our single degree of freedom model matches what we come up with for our uh, actual system. Okay, we'll do the same thing for the spring constant. You imagine that this, uh, that this beam here is, you know, elastic, right? It's able to flex, and so we should be able to come up with an, a statement for that beam of how much it will uh, deform under a given amount of load out on its end. All right, so those are two of the things that we want to do. And so I'll, I guess I'll um, write those up here. We got to find an equivalent mass and an equivalent uh, what was it? Uh, spring constant. So those are two things that we got to do. We also have to do a dynamics analysis, okay? So let's think about what happens when this dirt actually hits the beam, okay? When it hits the beam, we have a collision such that the dirt actually sort of sticks to the beam, all right? That's what this says when it says zero rebound. That basically says there is no energy, you know, that sort of causes the dirt to bounce on the beam. It's like it hits and sticks. Okay, when that occurs, if you remember back to your dynamics classes, is energy conserved? All right, that's a kind of a tricky question. Some, of pe some people are going, energy is always conserved. What are you talking about? All right, what I mean is, you know, is kinetic energy conserved? Is macroscopic kinetic energy conserved? Okay, and the answer is no. Whenever you have two bodies that hit and stick like that, there is actually uh, an absorption of energy. So I'll say over here, uh, in the collision, energy is not conserved. But is there something that is conserved? Okay, I heard someone say it. Momentum is conserved in the collision. Okay, so we are going to use these properties or these kind of uh, techniques in the uh, solution of this problem. Okay, momentum, the, the mathematical expression of it is basically mass times velocity, right? Uh, and that's one of our principles that we have, one of our big conservation principles that we have in physics and engineering is uh, the idea that whenever you have bodies that interact with one another in space, uh, momentum will always be conserved, okay? Even if energy is not, momentum will still be conserved. So this is a, a pretty slick technique that we can use. All right. Um, after the collision, let's actually talk about that. After the collision, once the dirt has landed on the beam and stuck, now do you think energy will be conserved? And I would say it doesn't look like there's anything else that would absorb energy in the system, at least not appreciably, right? So we are going to make the assumption after the collision occurs, at, from that point on, we'll make the assumption that energy is conserved and that will be useful to us uh, and so I think now, at this point, we should probably get started with the details, okay? So what's the easiest thing to do first, you think? <laughs> Someone says free body diagram. Um, what we can do, what I would suggest we do first here is, uh, since we're supposed to find these equivalent K and M values, let's get started on that, and K is actually an easier one to do uh, than M. So what we do for the K value 
we actually go to the tables that are in the back of the book. Okay, there's a, a number of tables back there. And uh, let's see if I can find one real quick. There's a table where it gives deflections for a cantilevered beam with a single, single uh, concentrated load out on the end of it. It says there that Y max is equal to negative FL cubed over 3EI. What's the negative mean? Yeah, the, the direction of the force in the figure for that table in the back of the book is downward, which is why the negative is there, which means we don't have to necessarily have to worry much about that. Uh, but I figured I'd write it exactly how they had it. How do I get a K equivalent out of a, an equation like this? What is a K, like a, a spring constant? Okay, it's, it's usually the force over the deflection, right? This equation includes both force and deflection, and so if I rearrange it, um, it tells me here, you know, you think about this, the, the force um, and the deflection are both here. It means K equivalent is equal to uh, 3EI over L cubed. Okay, and that's because we knew this. This was in, I'll make sure I make, put that reference there, uh, table A9. And that's the first entry in table A9. All right, well, how do we know these things? Well, um, I don't usually do this, but in, in this particular problem, um, I have this, since we, I gave you this to you as structural steel, and we have some other data that was also included in the uh, reference material that we use in Engineering 220. I'm going to actually use that for our information and data. Okay. So one of the things that you see here, we have S5 by 10. That was our beam that we wanted to use. There's a couple of different values that I want to uh, pick off of this table with respect to that beam. One of them is, go, I'll go up here and we want the uh, moment of inertia about the XX axis for an S5 by 10. So that's right here. It says 4.92, uh, excuse me, make sure I'm looking at the right one. It says 12.3 inches to the fourth for I. Let me put that up here. I equals 12 point, make sure I didn't read it wrong, 12.3 inches to the fourth. And actually, the other one I'm going to put in here is the section modulus. The section modulus is 4.92 inches cubed. And then lastly, uh, in this same set of reference material. I'm going to look up structural steel, and you'll see there that the uh, modulus of elasticity is cited as being 29,000 KSI. <clears throat> now this, you know, it, at this point you usually get concerned students saying, why are you using 29,000 when it's normally 30,000 uh, that we do in this class? Uh, it's because I didn't want to rewrite all these notes. I had these done, and, and I had 29,000 uh, in everything. So don't worry about it. I'm still going to have y'all do 30,000 uh, for everything that you do, but I'm using 29 just because I had these notes written. So I apologize if that causes anyone heartache. All right, so 3 times 29 times 10 to the 6th PSI times your I value there of 12.3 inches to the fourth. And then L, okay, we have a 12 foot long beam here. And then because everything else is in pounds and inches, no feet, I'm going to take that and multiply by 12 inches 
per foot down there in the denominator. Okay, and actually that was supposed to be cubed, right? So it's all of this cubed. Okay, so when we plug those values in, this ends up being 358.4 pounds per inch. All right, not a bad little warm up. Now what we're going to do is something that's a little bit more involved. Okay. We need to come up with an equivalent mass. Okay. So my equivalent mass, first of all, let me explain the philosophy of the equivalent mass. Okay. What we want to do with the equivalent mass is we want to be able to model this as instead of a distributed mass down the entire length of the beam, okay, where that mass is, is kind of distributed down the entire length, what we want to do is change this and turn it into a lumped mass. And I'll make that a little bit bigger. A lumped mass that has a particular value that we're trying to find. And we want for the amount of energy associated with a particular velocity, okay, imagine that this, imagine this mass having a velocity to it. We want for the, if, if there's gonna be a particular velocity at the end of the beam that's on the right, and that same velocity at the end of the beam that's on the left, we want for this to both contain the same amount of energy. Okay, so we basically want the energy here, and I mean kinetic energy, to equal the energy here. Okay, where this mass, we have the actual mass of the beam and it's distributed along the entire length. All right. So, we need to now express how would we know how much energy exists in each case. The right side is actually fairly easy. What do we have on the right side? Yeah, one half mass times, and this is your mass EQ, right? Times your velocity. squared. So that's how much energy we have over on the right side. How much energy do we have total over on the left side? Okay. So for this, we need to, we need to kind of think through this a little bit. Um, each little element of this beam, imagine this beam has a length of L, each little element of this beam, I'm gonna draw a little piece of it right here, has a particular velocity to it, right? And I'm gonna say that this is actually a velocity that is a function of X, where X is given by how far you are from the tip of the beam. Okay. The other thing that I want to do is, you know, because we're, it looks like we're about to start doing some calculus here, right? I want to go ahead and define what is my differential element. Okay. So my differential element is this little piece right here, and it has a differential width of dx. Okay, and not only that, but since it's a you know infinitesimally small width to it, it would make sense that it has an infinitesimally small 
mass to it. Okay, so we'll say this right here has a mass of dm. Okay, and the other thing we'll say is that the overall mass is m. So far, so good? Okay. So, one of the things I want to do here is I want to say um, this, is a, this beam has a uniform cross section to it. Right? There's no, it doesn't widen or narrow or anything like that. And so, what that means is that if I take a ratio of, let's say, a certain amount of mass over a certain amount of length, This would be true for differential pieces as well, right? So a differential mass over a differential amount of length. I've actually called that differential amount of length dx. Okay, and so what I want to do with this then is to say that dm is equal to m over l dx. Okay, so these are kind of uh, side things. Now let's actually get into dr to writing uh, an integral so that I can figure out what is the total amount of energy for all of the little elements of material that have velocities to them. Well, how do I do that? Well, first I need to actually make an expression for v of x. How do I do that? Okay. Well, what we do is we actually start with a deflection equation. All right, for this for this beam. In other words, the beam itself has a uh, an equation of the elastic curve. Do you agree with that? Okay. Um, so I'll tell you what, let's actually do this first. Let me write this equation. Uh, that I've, I've done too much talking without enough writing just yet. So let me do this. I'll say, this is our big picture. If I can integrate from zero to L of one half of V of X squared dm. that gives me my total amount of energy in that beam. Do you agree with that? So I, I probably should have, have written that a little bit earlier. Okay. Um, what we have here is we actually have a, a velocity squared on the left. We have a velocity squared on the, on the right. If you think about this, uh, there is no reason that those have to be velocities. Now that I have this expressed in terms of, um, of velocities, you can actually take the time unit out of it. All right, you can think about multiplying, let's say, both, both sides by time squared. Do you agree with that? It's like you'd multiply both sides by time squared. What do you end up with? Okay, over here, so let's say you're gonna multiply both sides by time squared. On the right side, what we get is one half your mass equivalent, your equivalent mass, <coughs> times, this is just going to be your maximum uh, delta, or the delta at the end. Maybe I'll put it like that squared. What about on the left side? Okay, I'll pull the one half out front. Uh, I'll have delta as a function of x squared dm.
I'll tell you what, let me actually also replace dm. I just cal calculated what dm was a second ago. What's dm? m over l dx. Okay, where m is actually the overall mass of the beam. All right. So now what? So what I did is I multiplied both sides by t squared, because you imagine uh, a velocity is a distance per time, yeah. right? So if you go through and you multiply both sides by whatever time basis you were using squared, you, you change it from a velocity into a amount of distance, which is exactly what we're dealing with in this case, is how far has it moved, right? How far has it moved per unit time was what we started with, Multiply through by time squared gives us an amount of distance that it has moved. And that gives us deflection. Yeah. All right. Um, so now we have, to, we have to do a little bit of more stuff here, OK? Um, make sure I've got my, uh, my distances and everything correct here. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at our uh, expression for an amount of deflection as a function of x. And so again, we can look at table A9, and what that gives us here, we can get rid of this one half, and what we get is an integral from 0 to L, your delta as a function of x becomes uh, fx over 6ei, times x minus 3L, okay, all of this is squared, okay, and then we have M over L, which let me pull that out here, because those are just both constants, and we have dx. And this is equal to my equivalent mass times the uh, amount of deflection that we have at the end. Okay. And this, let me put the note over here to the side. This expression right here comes from also from table A9. Let me make sure I didn't miss anything here. X squared, thank you. That, is that the one you were talking about? Yeah. All right. Um, so then the next thing is, do I have an expression for the delta at the end? Yeah, so I, I already found that one, right? I had up here or down here, I guess. Uh, my delta at the end was FL cubed over 3EI, right? And so I can also replace that, rearrange some things, and it gives me that MEQ My equivalent mass is going to be equal to m over l, integral from 0 to l, of fx squared over 6ei times x minus 3l, all of that squared dx over fl cubed over 3ei. squared. Now, we could keep on, you know, rolling with this. I could evaluate this integral. We could keep on going. But I think this shows the main steps that we needed to go from one thing to the other. 
And so what I'm going to do here, in the, uh, in the vein of Dr. Lee, after many dot, we get a result that's actually very interesting. The result we get is that this becomes 33 over 140 M. And that is a result, by the way, that can be verified. There's, it's, you know, that's a, a result that exists in certain reference materials that you can go look up. That if you want the single degree of freedom uh, sort of equivalent mass model for a cantilever beam that has uniform uh, mass per unit length, this is what you can do. Okay? Those, those are conditions that have to be met. It has to have uniform mass per unit of length. Uh, it has to be a cantilever but you can come up with an equivalent mass using this uh, formula, 33 over 140 M, and you don't have to go back through the derivation again. Yes, sir? Is that like a concept for any scenario like this? Or is that specific? That is not specific to this particular beam's cross-section, okay? Nor material, nor specific mass, but it is, the, the, the conditions have to be met. It has to be a cantilever with uniform uh, cross section basically uniform mass per unit length right down its entire length okay and it's really kind of interesting there that it doesn't matter how long the beam is right you doesn't matter it's, if it's a cantilever beam uh, with uniform mass per unit length we come up with this as our equivalent mass uh, model not bad huh all right, now we get into the dynamics. Because now, it's not hard for us to model the behavior of the system um, according to the single degree of freedom model that I referenced right there at the beginning. We have information now that allows us to sort of convert our original case into the uh, simplified case that we are trying to use. Okay. <clears throat> All right. I'm trying to remember. I think I came up with an actual value for my, uh, yeah. So my K equivalent is just 358.4 pounds per inch. Okay. So that's what I'm going to actually write over here. I'll put it over here, actually. Three fifty-eight point four pounds per inch. Make sure that's right. Yep. As my spring, and then my equivalent mass up here. Let me figure that out. What is my equivalent mass? Okay. Well, my actual mass is going to be equal to an S5 by 10 beam. What is those numbers actually mean something, right? Five is about how deep it is, means it's about a five inch tall beam. What does the 10 mean? 10 pounds per foot of length, okay? So this is a 120 pound beam, okay? So I'll put in here, this is 120 pounds. And if I want to put it as 120 pounds mass, I hate pounds mass, right? I don't think that pounds mass uh, is something that we should even sort of acknowledge as a thing. Um, and so what I want to do here is, uh, you know, actually let me say that this is, it weighs 120 pounds force. How do I go to a unit that I'd rather work with uh, in, uh, in the U.S. system? Okay. Yeah, I take this and I divide it by 32.2 foot per second squared. And this gives me a number of slugs. Well, we, we don't have the option of pounds force because we need it in a mass. We're going to do some dynamic stuff here. So we, we actually need this to be in, in units of mass. And so, uh, 
This is coming up with the overall mass of the beam. So the overall mass of the beam, maybe I'll put a reminder here. This is overall. Okay. And it's going to be 3.727 slugs. All right, this so far, yeah, that's a good question. So far, this is just the beam sitting there. This is the equivalent mass of the beam. And actually, this is not the equivalent mass of the beam. What's the equivalent mass of the beam? 33 over 140 times 3.727 slugs. And that gives me 0 0.87 eight four slugs. Okay. Let me put that on here. This is zero point eight seven eight four slugs. So now what we're going to do is we're going to look at this is the beam. This is how the beam behaves according to what its equivalent spring constant and mass is. And we're going to now imagine the dirt falling onto it. Okay. It's going to fall down and strike the, uh, you know, strike this body. One of the things that we need to know is how much mass of dirt are we talking about? All right, so what do we do there? Okay, we know it's 500 pounds of dirt. Take that and divide it by 32.2 foot per second squared. And this gives me a number of slugs of dirt, 15.528 slugs. All right, we've put it off long enough. We need to do our first uh, dynamics calculation. So we start from 10 feet above the beam. The 500 pound wad of dirt is, starts out 10 feet above the beam. What I suggest we do is divide this into a couple of phases. We have before the dirt hits the beam, so like from the beginning of the problem right to the point where it strikes the beam. What we can do there is an energy balance to figure out how fast is the dirt moving when it strikes the beam. Okay, let's start there. So I'll put up here, um, using energy conservation, to find the velocity of the dirt when it strikes the beam. Okay, that's our first step. So, what does that look like? Yeah, so the potential energy that we start with, which is due to the height at the beginning of the problem, has to equal the kinetic energy at the end of the problem, or at the end of this phase at least, uh, when it strikes the beam. Okay, what's the formula for uh, potential energy? So I'll say here PE at the beginning equals KE at the end of this phase. So the formula for potential energy at the beginning is MGH, okay? We actually already know MG, right? It's 500 pounds. Times 10 feet. 
and this is going to be equal to one half of the mass of the dirt, okay, which I guess maybe it would have been better to state this in terms of m, m and g. So let, I'll put that in here this way, 15.528 slugs times v squared. So this is v at impact. I guess before impact squared. And over here, mass is 15.528 slugs times 32.2 foot per second squared times 10 feet. Okay, which allows me to knock out the mass. And if I solve this for my velocity right before impact, it ends up being uh, 25.377. foot per second. All right. So what's next? Now we have to do the actual impact. Okay. So I'll say momentum before and after impact have to be the same. Okay. And momentum is what? mass times velocity. So the, uh, the beam itself did not have any velocity at, before the impact, right? So the only thing that has momentum before the impact is just the dirt, okay? And so the mass of the dirt, which is 15.528 slugs times the velocity of the dirt right at that instant before impact which we just found was 25.377 feet per second. We're saying this has to be equal to the momentum immediately after the impact. Okay, so how much mass do we have moving immediately after the impact? Okay, the mass of the dirt plus the equivalent mass that the dirt ran into. So that would be 0 0.8784 slugs. And now we put here, this is the velocity after the impact. So the velocity after the impact then uh, becomes 24.018 feet per second. Now again, uh, I'll state this one more time because this is the point in time where it matters. This is assuming a single degree of freedom response, okay? which is probably going to be the strongest single element of the response, but it, uh, it may not be complete. So in other words, you can think of this as, um, what if you, instead of striking it with dirt, you hit it with a small hammer 
on the end of the beam. It would probably ring, right? What is that? What does that mean? Yeah, that probably means it's not a single degree of freedom response if you, if you hit it with a hammer, right? It means the whole thing sort of has vibrations going through it, and it dis dissipated that energy in a different fashion due to how it landed, right? But with a soft, you know, clump of dirt like this, this might be an acceptable way for us to model it. Yes? It did. So what we had was the dirt right before it hit was going 25.377. Once it hits and sticks, then the whole thing, the, both the beam and the dirt are now moving down, you know, not actually very much less speed, okay. right? Kind of grabs the whole beam and starts pulling it down. Okay. All right. So far, so good. Now this one's the kind of the more interesting one. Now that we've had our impact and we've had our losses of energy that we potentially could have had, we can go back to our energy method and say, uh, we'll say the energy, uh, you know, at the beginning, of beam movement is the energy at the end of the beam movement, which is, uh, we'll say, full deflection, right? The beam is going to deflect downward, and it'll reach a point where it stops. Right, it reaches its maximum amount of deflection. So once it reaches its maximum amount of deflection, uh, it will have zero kinetic energy left. Right? So this is how we set this up. Um, there's sort of two elements of energy that we identify at the beginning. One of them is the kinetic energy. But the other one is a potential energy. Right, because we have this whole thing that's dropping. And so it goes through however far it deflects, that, it, that represents a change in energy. And then what do we have at the end? Okay, it's another type of potential energy. I often call this strain energy. Okay, because it's basically, it's storing the energy as you know, strain of the, you know, the uh, little microscopic bonds that hold the material together. Okay, so that's what we're going to do here. First of all, kinetic energy, one half. What mass should we use here? The combined mass, uh, 15.528 slugs plus 0.8784 slugs. Okay, one half m v squared. What's v? Twenty-four point zero one eight feet per second. Okay, I'm going to add on to this the uh, potential energy that I have at the beginning relative to what I'll have at the end. So when I define this potential energy, I'm using the end of the stroke basically as my datum, which means that I have potential energy now relative to where I'm going, right? It's like think of full deflection as where you're going to. And so what that means is again, MGH, right? Um, I can just put that in here as well, I can just put it in here if I want as a, I don't know, I've got M and everything. I'll, I'll put it in there like, a, like it is. M, G, 32.2 feet per second squared. 
and H. Okay, this is a different H than we had at the beginning because we're now not dropping through the 10 feet. We're dropping through the amount that the beam falls, right? How far does it deflect? So this is just basically, uh, I'll call delta max. Right here? I sure did. Appreciate that. All right. Now, what does this all equal? Okay. So the energy stored in a spring, what's the energy stored in a spring? There's a formula for that. Okay, one half K delta squared. Right, so I'll say one half of my K equivalent, 358.4 uh, pounds per inch times your delta there, which is again, how far does it deflect at its maximum deflection? Squared. And if we punch all of this in and solve for delta max, delta max ends up being 19.195 inches. All right, questions yet at this point? So now the question is, what do we do with this? We, we know how far the beam has deflected in response to the dirt dropping on it. This is the maximum deflection ex it experiences. What kind of things do we want to know? Go back up to the beginning. Okay, we figured out max deflection, awesome. Bending stress, that's the next one, okay? Well, this, you know, this is how far it's deflecting. It's, it's deflecting as a result of there being a load out on the end of it, right? It came from a dynamic effect, but it's, it's again, it's not different. It's still just a load out on the end of the beam. So what would the amount of maximum stress be? First of all, where does it occur? Back at the wall. And so all we have to do here is uh, we can go back through this equation and say sort of the maximum force is equal to uh, your K value times the maximum deflection. And this is kind of an imaginary force, okay? This force doesn't actually really exist anywhere, <laughs> so it's, it's a little bit hard to think about. The reason that we are going to talk about this force is it's basically um, the force that would exist in this sort of model of how we're doing it. It's the force that would exist between the spring and the mass that's being applied to it, right? By lumping the mass, it kind of creates an, a force, as it were, that doesn't really exist in real life. But we can still calculate it, and we can then use it with what we know about the beam to come up with a stress. Yes, sir? The reason for that is that, you know, you can imagine it after it gets to its most, you know, bottom most position and you have all this spring energy loaded in the, uh, in the beam, you can imagine that it is actually accelerating the dirt and, the, and its own mass upward, right? The, the uh, contact force between the dirt and the beam is going to be based on the mass of the dirt only that it is accelerating, not the mass of itself that it is accelerating, all right? We're actually gonna do that step of the problem at the, right after I do this one, okay? But that's, that's why it ends up being different uh, than this maximum force that we uh, identify here. All right, so the K equivalent here is 
uh, pounds per inch. And the delta that we have is 19.195 inches. And this ends up telling me that F max is equal to 6,879 pounds. But I don't even really care about that result very much. Again, it's, it doesn't really even hardly represent a real thing. I need it though so that I can do what? I need to find stress. Okay, and this is stress at the wall, wherever the cantilever is being supported. And so the stress at the wall uh, ends up being the amount of moment that is carried at the wall, which is 6,879 pounds times what? 144 inches. That's just uh, 12 feet times what? Or, I mean, actually, one of the things that we looked up was the section modulus, right? M over S gives us stress. So what was that, 4.92 cubic inches? Okay, and this ends up giving us 201.3 KSI. Something tells me that this structural steel is not going to like that. This is, so the length of the beam is 12 feet right there. And so, you know, we basically took that 12 feet we took that 12 feet and just went ahead and converted to inches. All right. So now, the last step that we wanted to do, it's the one I, I kind of started talking about, and it's how much contact force exists at this bottom, you know, wherever the, when it reaches the bottom of its motion, how much contact force exists between the beam and the um, and the, uh, you know, the dirt itself, okay? And the way this works is that the contact force is going to be equal to the maximum force times the ratio of the, uh, of the masses. You know, in the numerator, we put the mass of just the dirt. In the denominator, we put the mass of the dirt plus the mass, the equivalent mass of the beam. <clears throat> and this ends up telling me that my contact force is actually only 6,510 pounds. Okay, and again, this is based on the idea that uh, it, you know, the, the uh, energy that's stored in the beam that is tending to try to accelerate all of the mass upward, some of the mass that it's accelerating is itself, and that doesn't contribute to the contact force between the bodies, right? It's only the amount of mass that it's having to accelerate that is the dirt. That's what leads to the uh, amount of contact force between these two bodies. All right, so we've answered our questions. Let me answer your questions. You have any questions?
Right. Yeah, if this had been a, uh, let's say this had been a simply supported beam, okay. right? A few things would have changed. One, our, uh, our whole technique of finding the equivalent mass would have to be different. It'd, you can use the same technique, but the answer would be different, right? We would not be able to use that for a simply supported beam. Uh, maybe. We don't have those tables in this textbook. They, you know, that kind of stuff does exist different places. Um, so yeah, that, you know, it is out there, but uh, it may not be something that we have in this textbook. Uh, yes, sir. Um, I, had, I am not actually planning on having you develop that for a different beam case. Ten four. Do you have a question? Yeah. So, and one of the things that you know, I, I would say this: if the beam was made out of a better kind of steel, it may have a shot, right? What did we figure out that it had? You know, what was that stress value? There it is: two hundred and one point three ksi. That's a lot of stress, right? So. If this is made out of structural steel and you know the kind of the accepted value for strength of structural steel is about 36 ksi, right? We're uh, we're well outside the point where it would begin to yield. Okay, so um, I would say, yeah, that's a that's an indicator. You know, if you try to move this thing by not quite two feet on a 12 foot beam, you know, that's a lot of deflection, um, and so that kind of shows up in that stress value as well. So. Um, but I mean, you get you get the idea. If, if this weight had been a lot less, or if the drop distance had been a lot less, it might have been something that turned out a little bit more favorable uh, in terms of whether or not the material would withstand it. Anyone else? Yes. Um, that was down here, I think, way down here. Is this, you're talking about this part? Oh, so you want to see on this table? Okay, I use this 29,000 KSI, okay, for your E value, which I'll also give you the warning. I did that just because I, I had this developed using these this information and I didn't change it, um, but not a hard thing for you to change to 30,000 KSI if you need to. Um, and then uh, you'll see here 36 um, KSI, that's, that's the value I just cited as far as the strength of structural steel. We didn't use that, but that gives you an idea of 201 KSI is a lot bigger than that. And then uh, the other thing we looked at was this table of standard beams, right? S5 by 10, and we looked up I value of 12.3, and a S value of 4.92. So one of the things that uh, is available for you on, on Moodle is all of that reference material that I have right there. In most cases, I say we don't need it. But in case you need to look up an I-beam or something and we don't have those in the text that we are currently using, you can find that data in that other reference material. Um, not really. I'm, I'm not going to hold you accountable to having that reference material. In other words, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to throw something on the test where you really, really needed this stuff in that, and then I would, don't give it to you. Anything else? All right. Well, I will uh, see you on Friday. <laughs>